Today, we'll be examining two disturbing cases of family members killing their own. In 1991, Michigan man Gregory Green stabbed his wife in the face and chest, killing her and their unborn child. Then he called 911 and waited for police to arrive. After serving about 16 years in prison for murder, Green was released on parole with the support of family and friends, including a pastor who lobbied on his behalf and whose daughter Green would marry. Gregory and I were friends before his mishap and he was incarcerated. Fred Harris, a pastor in Detroit, wrote to the Michigan Parole Board in August 2005. He was a member of our church. I feel he has paid for his unfortunate lack of self-control and the damage he has caused as much as possible and is sorry. If he was to be released, he would be welcomed as a part of our church community and whatever we could do to help him adjust, we would. Harris wrote again a year later. Green was released in 2008 and later married Faith Harris. They had two daughters, Coy, five, and Kaylee, four. Then came a shocking slaughter. Early in the morning of September 21st, 2016, Faith Harris Green found herself bound with duct tape and zip ties in the basement of their home in Dearborn Heights, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. Her foot had been shot and her face slashed with a box cutter, prosecutors say. Her two teenage children, Gregory Green's stepchildren, were with her, dead of gunshot wounds. She had watched them die. Her two younger children were dead upstairs, poisoned with carbon monoxide. The killer was Harris Green's husband, the same man whose freedom her father advocated for more than a decade ago. As Green did when he killed his first wife, he called 911 and waited for police to come, authorities said. He had just shot his family and they were inside the house, he told officers. Green is back in prison. Last week, he received what amounts to a life sentence. He'll be 97 by the time he's eligible for parole, according to the prosecutor's office. During the sentence hearing, Harris Green, wearing a white turtleneck, spoke to her children's killer, perhaps for the last time. You are a con artist, a monster, you're a devil in disguise, but you are now forever exposed. She said as she stood behind a podium in a Wayne County courtroom. Her ex-husband, in a dark green jail uniform, sat stoically a few feet away, his back towards her. No punishment will be enough for her children's death, Harris Green said. Not even torture and death would be justice. Your justice will come when you burn in hell for all eternity for murdering four innocent children, all because you're insecure, she said. A spokeswoman for the prosecutor's office said Harris Green has asked to not be contacted by the media. She was granted a divorce in December, according to the media reports. What prompted Green to kill his family and why he immediately confessed to it, is unclear. He had been found mentally competent, the Detroit News reported. Last month, when he pled guilty to the charges, Green cried as he described what he'd done. Unfortunately, I took the lives of Kaylee, Coy, Chadney, and Kara, he said in court, according to Detroit News. I shot my ex-wife. I left my two girls in the car. Kara and Chadney, I shot them. The car was filled with carbon monoxide while the two children were inside. Investigators found duct tape on the muffler of the car. A plastic tube was attached to it, according to the prosecutor's office. The bodies were later moved inside the house. 
Green also spoke during his sentencing hearing last week. His brief statement was apologetic, but he gave no explanation on the motive behind the violent deaths. I feel bad for how this has deeply impacted everyone, and may God help them, help me, he said in court. Green was denied parole four times, twice in 2004 and twice in 2006, before he was released in 2008, said Chris Gouts, a spokesman for the Michigan Department of Corrections. If the parole hadn't been granted, Green would have been released in 2012, got said. His prison record provided nearly no trace of violence, no hint that years after he would be released, he would commit crimes way more brutal than the first. His history while incarcerated appeared clean, if not perfect. Records show that although he was unable to explain the outburst that brought him to prison, he nevertheless followed the rules and stayed out of trouble. Excellent good block reports, good past work history, reads his parole eligibility report. He is respectful to staff and other prisoners, no minor conducts to report, reads another. Green had only one misconduct while incarcerated. He was given a ticket in 2002 for getting involved in a fist fight over a television, Gout said. By the time his parole was granted in 2008, Green had completed educational programs in prison, Gouts added. He also had plans for work once he was released. During a news conference in September, Dearborn Heights Mayor Dan Poletko summed up the sheer lack of explanation for Green's murderous outrage. It's just difficult to understand the motivation. I just don't understand what happened in this household, Poletko told reporters. I just can't fathom this whole process. I don't understand it. Hard as she tried, Melanie Alix failed to persuade a jury that she was a victim. On their sixth day of deliberations, the seven women and five men, who listened for almost two weeks as the 31-year-old South Shore resident, recounted her troubled life in painstaking detail, instead decided yesterday that Alix is a cold-blooded killer who targeted vulnerable members of her own family. Alix barely flinched as the jury found her guilty as charged of arson and first-degree murder in the death of her wheelchair-bound mother, Francine Levesque, in a 2001 house fire. They also declared her guilty of arson and first-degree murder in the death of her one-year-old son, Matisse Alix LeBlanc, in a separate fire two years later, as well as a charge of attempted murder against another person who cannot be named. The case hinged on evidence showing that both Levesque and Matisse perished of smoke inhalation long before firefighters and paramedics arrived. Prosecutor Julie Busset said after the verdict, It wasn't just the case of death, it was the time of death that was important in this case, Buches said. There were also eerie and inexplicable similarities between two cases that went far beyond coincidence, she added. Both Levesque and Matisse were found to have been drugged with the sleep-inducing antidepressant Oxazepam, for which Alix had a prescription. Both fires were deliberately set, investigators determined, but they pointed out that the flames had originated in multiple unconnected sites at different times. For instance, one fire flared and died at Levesque's Lacarde home on January 31, 2001 allowing the air to cool enough for a suit to settle on her prostrate body before a major inferno attracted calls to 911. At Alix's white clapboard home in St. Blaise, 
The fire scene analysis said there were six separate sites of origin for the May 12, 2003 blaze. Firefighters discovered two charred chairs had been set alight in the living room, but were already cold by the time they had responded to a larger fire started on the stovetop. During her trial in Longueuil, which lasted more than two months, Alique's defense team ultimately described her mother's death as a fatal accident, but it also went to great lengths to cast suspicion on others for the two deaths. Alex openly blames her brother for her mother's bleh, mutters. Alex openly blames her brother for her mother's murder and her ex-boyfriend Stefan LeBlanc for her sons. Buchesny said the jurors saw through Alex's blame game. I find it unfair that the finger was pointed at Stefan LeBlanc, the father of this child, who was not there this day and at Francois Alix, who lost his mother in the fire, Buchesny said. The jury's verdict also undoubtedly turned on Alix's credibility. Throughout her testimony, Alix portrayed herself as a perpetual victim of childhood sexual abuse at the hands of her grandfather, of adolescent sexual abuse by her brother, of rape and continual physical abuse by her ex, of car accidents and of police torture. Under cross-examination, Alix displayed not a hint of emotion in recounting her Sophie's Choice moment. She described fighting thick smoke to reach Matisse's crib, but leaving the room without him because she drew him off as already dead. During her long days on the witness stand, Alix had an explanation for everything, but contradicted herself many times when confronted with her videotaped confession to police during an interrogation the day after Matisse's funeral. Alix admitted to investigators in 2003 that she had drugged her children before setting a fire on the stovetop, fed by oil from the fryer. But in court, she said the detective put words in her mouth and that she gave her children oxes upon, only to calm them because they were concerned for her safety after their father threatened her with death. Alix wrote a will the night before her son died. On the witness stand, she said it was to make sure her children got her money if her ex were to kill her. But the prosecutor pointed out to Alix that the only mention of her children was that she wanted to be buried with them in the family plot. After the jury was sequestered, Alix phoned the Journal de Montreal and declared herself the victim of an unfair trial. A prosecutor who was too congenial with the media and a judge she characterized as mean. She also told the newspaper she would appeal any guilty verdict, bring a complaint against Quebec Superior Court Justice Franz Charbonnet and ask for an inquiry into the Cerite de Quebec's handling of her case. The jury also didn't hear that Alix set her clothes on fire while at Tanguay Prison in a failed attempt at self-immolation, and that she once was suspected of setting fire to LeBlanc's jeep. Alix will automatically be sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole, for 25 years for the two murders.